Now we will consider a very important class of integrals of the following form. From minus infinity to infinity, e to i lambda x, g of x, dx. These integrals are important because they form a cornerstone of Fourier analysis. So it's crucial to learn how to use complex analysis to compute them. The function g of x, considered as a function of complex variable, is assumed to be homeomorphic in upper or lower complex semiplanes. We already understand that the crucial ingredient for computation of such integrals with the help of residue theorem is the completion of the contour with upper or lower semicircles. But for the use of residue theorem to be practical, the integrals along these arcs need to vanish. Naively, as we would expect from our previous video, this would require that function g of z decays at z tending to infinity faster than 1 over z. But in reality, this condition can be relaxed and substituted with condition of g of z simply tending to zero as the modulus of z tends to infinity. In fact, the condition is slightly more subtle, but we will return to this in a minute. This relaxation is possible due to the presence of the exponential function in our integrand. Indeed, the exponential function is suppressed for positive lambdas if we go upward in the complex semiplane, and for negative lambdas if we move downward in the complex semiplane. So the precise statement is known as Jordan's lemma. It is formulated for two types of integrals. The integral along the upper semicircle with positive lambdas, and the integral along the lower semicircle for negative lambdas. We will formulate and prove it for the upper semicircle case. The statement for a lower semicircle is completely symmetric, and the proof will be your homework exercise. And the formulation is as follows. Suppose we have an integral along the upper semicircle of radius r tending to plus infinity, and the integrand is of the form e to i lambda z g of z dz. Now, if lambda is positive, and the function g of z tends to zero uniformly with respect to its argument as r tends to infinity, then the whole integral tends to zero. First of all, I need to clarify what the uniform convergence of function g of z really means. And in this context, it's equivalent to the following statement. We say that the function tends to zero uniformly with respect to its argument at the radius of the arc tends to infinity if the maximum value of its modulus on the arc tends to zero at the radius of the arc tends to infinity. And now, let us prove the theorem. We need to build an estimate for our integral, and our first step is the usage of triangle inequality. The modulus of the integral is always less than the integral of the modulus. Now let us introduce a standard parameterization, z equals r times e to i phi, then dz is equal to r e to i phi i d phi, and substitute this change into our estimate. So our integral is less than the following expression. Now the modulus of the exponential with cosine can be substituted with 1, while the modulus of the exponential with sine function can be removed because it's a positive number. Now the modulus of the g function, and here is the place where its uniform convergence comes on stage. The modulus of the g function is of course less than the maximum of its modulus as we see it on this circle. Let's denote this maximum value as m with subindex r. And as we understand, this number m sub r tends to zero as r tends to infinity. This is precisely what the uniform convergence means. So we substitute modulus of g of z with this m r number and obtain the next step of our upper estimate of the integral. And now let's have a quick look at our integrand. Its phi dependence only enters in terms of sine function in the exponential. But sine function is symmetric with respect to pi by two direction as we move from zero to pi angle. So this integral can be substituted with the double of the integral from 0 to pi by 2. So let us do this. And since our domain is reduced to the region from 0 to pi by 2, we can use a very suitable estimate for a sine function on this domain. And indeed, sine function is presented as an arc going from the origin to 1 as we move from 0 to pi by 2. And it's always positioned higher than the corresponding line which connects the origin and the point 1 and pi by 2. The equation of this line is 
to phi over pi. And this way we obtain a very useful inequality. Sine of phi is always greater than 2 phi over pi for phi belonging to the segment from 0 to pi by 2. Now flipping the sign and exponentiating this inequality, we obtain the crucial inequality for our problem. e2 minus lambda r sine phi is always smaller than e2 minus lambda r to phi by pi. And therefore we obtain the next estimate for our integral. It's less than mr times r times the integral over a simple exponential into minus lambda r to phi by pi d phi. And this integral is easily taken with antiderivatives. And the answer is 1 minus e2 minus lambda r divided by 2 lambda r by pi. And we see that large prefactor r is compensated by the same large factor in the denominator. And obtain our final estimate. And as mr tends to 0, as r tends to infinity, the whole integral tends to 0. And the same statement is true for lower arc integrals, but for negative lambdas. And now let's suggest some simple example just to see how the theorem works in practice. We will take the following integral from minus infinity to plus infinity e to i alpha x over x plus i dx for positive and negative alphas. Let us first consider the case of positive alphas. Our first step is to complete the integration contour. And keeping in mind the possible usage of Jordan's lemma, let's complete the integration contour with an upper semicircle. Now let's promote our integrand into a complex plane and denote it as f of z. And separately, let's denote our g of z function is 1 over z plus i. Obviously, our new closed contour integral is equal to our original integral plus a semicircular arc integral. And the integrand is precisely of the form which enters the Jordan's lemma. Our g of z function decays as 1 over z for large values of z and obviously tends to 0 independently of its argument. So this part of Jordan's lemma is satisfied. And since alpha is positive, then the integral along this upper arc vanishes. And therefore, our closed contour integral is simply equal to our original integral. And now we may employ residue theorem to compute it. So the closed contour integral is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residue of our integrand inside this contour. But there are no poles inside. The only pole of our function is z equals minus i. And it is outside. That is why our closed contour integral and as a result our original integral is equal to 0 for positive values of alpha. Now let's consider the case of negative alphas. This time let's complete our contour with a lower semicircle, keeping in mind a possible usage of Jordan's lemma. Again, our closed contour integral is equal to our original integral plus the integral along a lower semicircle. The integral along the lower semicircle vanishes due to Jordan's lemma. So as before, our original integral is equal to our closed contour integral. And now we may use residue theorem, namely, the closed contour integral is equal to 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of our function inside this contour. But in this particular case, our contour is passed in negative direction, because as we move along it, the region inside stays to our right, and that is why the closed contour integral is equal to actually minus 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of our function inside. So always pay attention to the orientation of your contour. So we obtain minus 2 pi i times the residue of our function f of z and point z equals minus i. And the residue of the function is trivially evaluated and we obtain minus 2 pi i times e2 alpha. And this way we completed the computation of our integral. The answer can be expressed via unit step function, namely minus 2 pi i times e2 alpha times theta of minus alpha, where theta is a unit step function. So we are done with our first example of the usage of Jordan's lemma. Now next videos we'll practice more with it and study more interesting examples. Mm -hmm.